Hi. So, I don't normally do things like this, so I apologize if it comes off a little too scripted or stiff. Today, I wanted to talk about the endings to Life is Strange, as well as some of the less obvious themes going on. If you haven't already watched both of the endings, please go do that before watching this, because everything past this point is going to be major spoilers. First, let's talk about sacrificing Chloe. This ending is so beautiful and also sucks so bad. A lot of people consider this the right thing to do or like the morally correct ending. It certainly presents itself as such. You've saved the town! We even get the final song of the soundtrack playing over the ending, which is significant. For the most part, the songs in the soundtrack parallel the story of the game with their lyrics, so having the final song play only in this ending is meaningful. However, instead of really focusing on the town being saved, most of this ending lingers on Chloe's death. In fact, it only really has this one shot of Max overlooking the town to show you that things are okay. The laser focus on Chloe being gone really works to give you this strange aftertaste that maybe you've chosen incorrectly. Since the storm doesn't come in this ending, we now know that its existence is tied to Max gaining her powers. It has nothing to do with whether or not Chloe dies, since the storm still came in the timeline where Jefferson shot her in the junkyard. This storm existing is absolutely bound to Max accepting the use of her powers for the first time. I'm also 100% sure that refusing to use her powers for the first time in the bathroom means she never gains them at all. In the photo montage, we see this shot of her staring very closely at a Polaroid. She's trying to jump through a photo to undo her decision, or maybe even just to see Chloe again, but she can no longer do it. It also might be worth mentioning at this point that the storm might have been caused directly by the butterfly. By preventing Chloe's death, we keep it from landing on the coffin on Friday, which changes the path it would fly. After all, the phrase is, a butterfly flapping its wings can cause a hurricane on the other side of the world. We may have caused a literal butterfly effect. However, I feel like this is probably too obvious and kind of too dumb for this game, so it's probably more incidental than anything else. A literal butterfly effect also doesn't explain any of the other world-ending phenomena like the double moon. In the other ending, we see Max sacrificing all of Arcadia Bay to keep Chloe alive. Sadly, this is an obvious spot where it looks like time and money ran out in the production of the game. This ending feels extremely rushed, especially in comparison with the elaborate production of tragedy in the other ending. However, I do think that they managed to mirror the strange feeling the other ending gave me. At first blush, this is very much a selfish ending, the wrong ending, but there's definitely this lingering feeling that maybe it's okay? Maybe what we did wasn't the wrong thing. But the town is destroyed, so how could this be? Throughout the game, we've kind of had this constant background noise of nature symbolism and random mentions of the native people of the Pacific Northwest. Samuel brings up the concept of spirit animals, which is actually a super important theme to the game. In fact, I think the animals and nature symbolism are the key to understanding the Sacrifice Arcadia Bay ending. Before I go any further, I want to clarify some things about spirit or totem animals. The idea of a spirit animal is usually thrown around as this concept that the animal represents you because you have similar traits. This is kind of right, but it has more to do with the idea that nature is trying to speak to you and the animal chosen has relevance to yourself or your situation. This is also very specifically a Native American concept and I am just a regular flavor white person, so I tried to research it as accurately as I could. When we say Native American, it refers to an extremely broad collection of cultures and beliefs. What we want to talk about here is tribes in the Pacific Northwest area, so I tried to keep a narrow focus on my research to the beliefs of the people in those areas. So, spirit animals, they are very important to this game. Let's start with the recurring image of the doe, who at first seems to represent Rachel Amber, but by the end of the game is clearly here for Max. Max usually is wearing the doe in some form, either on her shirt or on her necklace. It's her guide in her original vision of how to escape the storm at the end of episode one. 
We also saw the doe in the junkyard in episode two, but what you might have missed is that she was lying on Rachel's grave to begin with. Across several tribes in the Northwest, the doe is associated with kindness, compassion, and peace. They represented messengers or ambassadors. These traits are important parts of Max's personality, but they are also important in the idea that the doe is nature's way of trying to communicate directly with Max. A quick aside about the doe, there was a piece of Native American mythology that I stumbled onto called the Deer Woman. She was a doe who would disguise herself as a woman, either as a young girl or an old crone. There are a lot of scattered theories about the homeless woman that we met behind the two whales, and that she might be an alternate Max from another timeline. I don't think there's any gravity to that theory, but the idea that maybe she's another incarnation of the doe in human form is interesting at the very least. Another animal we see a lot of is the blue jay. Nearly every time we're in Chloe's house, we come across the blue jay and are given options to kill or save it. The blue jay is pretty much a direct representation of Chloe and our constant choices regarding her safety. In a lot of the Northwest Coast tribes, the blue jay was considered a trickster hero, a character in many of their stories who was very good-hearted but couldn't help himself from causing mischief. That description of the blue jay is also the perfect one-sentence write-up of Chloe's personality, so there's no way that it's not intentional. Another aside here, the bird that we saved downstairs in episode 3, I couldn't recognize. It's this brown bird with a yellow face. Looking it up, I think it's this kind of warbler, classified by, oh, by the Prescott Audubon Society, okay. Anyway, before we move on to the more major players, there are two minor animal totems that I wanted to mention. The whale is the first, and we see them beach themselves in large numbers at the end of episode 3. But why? Is it just another sign of the apocalypse? Maybe it's that simple, but I did find that whales were incredibly important to the native people of the northwest coast. They were believed to offer themselves up as food to help people survive in times of trouble. I think maybe they beached themselves on purpose to try and offer themselves to help Arcadia Bay, but that's entirely speculation on my part. Another minor animal is the owl, and his participation is a little bit less obvious. We see an owl in the eaves of the barn immediately before finding the truth of Rachel Amber, and we see at least two owls in the junkyard before Jefferson attacks at the end of episode 4. A lot of people seem to think that the owl represents Mr. Jefferson directly, with the wisdom of a teacher or something something. It's way more simple than that. Owls represent death. Hearing owls hooting was always considered an unlucky omen. They were used in spooky stories to try and keep children to stay inside at night. Every time we see an owl, Max has a very close encounter with death. The last totem animal I want to talk about is the blue butterfly. The butterfly is Rachel's animal. Every time we see a butterfly, it is presumably tied to Rachel in the afterlife, and we see them everywhere throughout the entire game. Butterflies always seem to represent change and balance, and some tribes consider them to be good luck to the point of having taboos against killing them. The significance of the color of the butterfly is that blue is the color that ties all three girls together. Blue is Max's bracelets. Blue is Chloe's hair. And blue is Rachel Amber's feather. Not only is it a symbol of Rachel watching over us, it's a symbol that ties all three girls together. Alright, so there's a whole lot of nature symbolism in this game. What does that have to do with the Sacrificing the Bay ending? I believe that destroying Arcadia Bay is what the spirit of the land was trying to accomplish by giving Max her powers. We are constantly reminded that shit here is totally fucked even before Max moved back. The Prescotts have been building on sacred land. The fish in the bay have been dying out. Normal people have been struggling to find work and survive. There seems to be some unexplainable imbalance in the world here. From the very first moment of the game, we're shown the storm and the path to safety out of the way. This is the goal and the path that we're being offered. It's a deal being laid out by the powers that be. In fact, it's a pretty good deal. All three girls stand to gain from this offer. At the moment that Max is given her powers, all three girls are there in the same room, Rachel represented by her butterfly. Max is offered the opportunity to learn who she really is. 
Chloe is offered another chance at life, and Rachel is offered justice for her death. In exchange for this, Max has to accept the use of her powers, cause the storm, and save the land from the blight of the town. The land speaks to her through the spirit of the deer, and it shows her again and again how she and Chloe can be safe and survive the storm. To really hammer this home, on their way out we see the town full of deer, unafraid of Chloe's truck, frolicking and happy on the land that they've reclaimed. There's even a mural of Oregon represented by a doe. There are many other ways to interpret the endings, including that Max's powers are a metaphor for learning to accept that you can't change the past, and I think these other interpretations are really awesome. I feel like the developers tried to leave a lot of the game open so you can find your own meaning in things. What I've discussed here is just my own favorite interpretation of the endings, so if you disagree with it, that's cool too. I hope that no matter what you think of it, you enjoyed the game and maybe found your own meaning in it. Even if you've watched every second of this LP, I cannot stress enough how much it's worth buying the game to play on your own. Don't Nod really deserves your money, this game is so good. Anyway, this has gotten super long, so I'm going to cut it off here. I hope you enjoyed the bonus video and the rest of the LP. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you again next time.